Now, MPs on the Transport Select Committee have sort of come out in favour of the government's plans for a new high-speed rail line. Richard Lister is our correspondent. And, Richard, I say sort of because they've given so many caveats to this support that one wonders uh, really where they end up being. What's your assessment? Yes, you might come close to saying they're damning it with faint praise, really, because, I mean, the opening line of their conclusions is that there is a good case for proceeding with high-speed rail network, that it would have passengers, uh, benefits for passengers and for rail freight services. But it goes on to more or less say that nobody has actually made this good case for High Speed 2 yet. Uh, and it says there are a number of problems with the existing parameters that have been set out in favour of High Speed 2, that while there may be potential catalysts for economic growth from HS2, the economic benefits aren't clear. The carbon reduction benefits being talked about don't stand up to scrutiny. There is, uh, there will be substantial impact on the communities en route, and the government was too quick to rule out um, a slower service along existing transport corridors. So, one way or another, there is something for all sides on this debate to hold up and say, look, this proves our point. Uh, a couple of suggestions they make, uh, not least about where the building should start. Yes, they're saying that the government um, has always said that uh, the, the route should be London to Birmingham first and then looking at a sort of Y-shaped uh, high-speed rail connection linking Birmingham with Leeds uh, and Manchester and then perhaps sometime in the future Scotland. They're saying, well, the government should also consider building from the north to the south uh, and explain why that isn't uh, the best idea uh, and that in any case, even if they do continue with the London to Birmingham first uh, idea, that the Y-shaped piece connecting uh, the, the north uh, has to be integral to that process and should be run really concurrently. So how is the government going to react to this? Is it going to feel that it has support from it and be pleased about pushing ahead? Well, it's certainly food for thought, and we're looking at a project which is broadly supported by all the major parties, so it seems unlikely that it won't go ahead in some form. But at the same time, I think this really does make the case that if the government does want to come out and, and support High Speed 2 probably next month, which is the time frame we're looking at, then it has an awful lot of um, issues that it needs to address in order to be able to make the case without undue criticism, uh, not least the financial case, which... Uh, the Transport Select Committee is saying really hasn't been made yet and where assessments have been made they've been using parameters which aren't widely accepted so I think this really does say to the government not exactly go back to the drawing board but certainly look what you've done so far and, and work out whether it can be refined and presented in a more palatable matter, a more palatable way Well we'll be speaking to the Chairman of the Transport Committee at 10 to 8 Richard Lister, thank you The time's six minutes to seven MPs on the Transport Select Committee have come out in support of the government's plans for high-speed rail, but they raise some very large doubts. They question many of the environmental claims that have been made, they say the cost-benefit analysis isn't clear, and they raise concerns that under the plans the lines wouldn't reach Manchester and Leeds for more than 20 years. They've suggested instead the government start building in the north and move southwards. Well, Ian Williams is from Leeds, York and North Yorkshire Chambers of Commerce and joins us from Leeds now. Good morning. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, what's your view on the plans as they stand now? Well, we've been very supportive of high-speed rail coming to the north from virtually from day one. We met with Lord Adonis and his successor from the Conservative government and we've been showing our support all the way through. Even though it's be 2032, I think, before the building even starts for the your section of the track. Indeed so, but I think what we're doing for the one of the first times is looking long-term at the needs of our country in terms of transport, and we see high-speed rail just as part of an overall transport solution. We recognise, and we're disappointed to a certain extent that it would take so long to reach our region, but we recognise this is a major, major infrastructure project for this country. Do you think that the government would have an easier job getting it through if they did start building from the north and do... Because it's, the eventual idea is that it would be a Y shape, that actually if they started with the top end of the Y, the mean, Manchester leads to, to Birmingham? Well, I think what we would hope is that they'd probably start at both ends. So start from do London the whole to thing. Birmingham. Do the whole thing. <laughs> we, yeah, do the whole thing in one go. I think that would help both in terms of planning, it would help in terms of encouraging apprenticeships, let's say, because companies who are going to build these lines will actually be able to plan with certainty how much staffing they'll need, what sort of skills they'll need, etc. But we're talking about such huge sums of money, and the Transport Select Committee makes the point that actually they haven't, government yet hasn't successfully, conclusively made the case that this is going to be money well spent. 
I think that's one argument. The research we've done here in uh, in this region shows there's a considerable return on that investment, both on, on jobs and in terms of increased productivity, increased access to markets, etc., both national and international. Explain Explain why that should be. In terms of increased, it, it's not just about connectivity and speed of travel, it's also about accessing markets. In this region, we, we, we don't do a great deal of work with the Midlands, etc., because it's not that easy to access. Having Birmingham less than an hour away should increase the amount of business we do with that region. And also in terms of the East Midlands itself, again, opening up a new market, one of the, the there are so many concerns that people have about this, but one is the obvious thing about building a, lane, a, a rail line through country. Uh, in many cases, absolutely beautiful countryside. Mm-hmm. You're going to have the same problems, but if you're suggesting going from Leeds to Birmingham, as as there are between London and Birmingham. We are indeed, and I think that's why it has to be a very, very thorough planning process that looks at all the considerations, not just environmental, and we recognise that there were really significant environmental impacts, but some of the claims that have been made so far have been quite um, extreme, I think, in terms of noise and impact. And obviously the proposals from government are to reduce those environmental impacts to as minimal as they can. Ian Williams, thank you very much. Imagine hopping on a train in Birmingham and being in London in 49 minutes, or travelling from Manchester to London in 80 minutes. That's why the government is keen to build a high-speed rail network. There has been huge opposition to their plans. But today, MPs on the Transport Select Committee say the government has made a good case for its proposals, but they raise some serious concerns. They question many of the environmental claims that have been made. They say the cost-benefit analysis isn't clear. And they raise concerns that, under the plans, the lines wouldn't reach Manchester and Leeds for more than 20 years. Well, we'll be speaking to the chair of the committee in a moment. First, though, Nicola Stanbridge is in Kenilworth in Warwickshire, near to where the proposed line would run. Hello, Nicola. Good morning, Sarah. We are feeding the cattle on Melbourne Grange Farm this morning, rather beautiful pedigree beef shorthorns. Paul Hunt is the third generation of his family to farm here in Kenilworth near Coventry, 200 acres of Warwickshire countryside, and it's on the high speed to route. Paul, how does that change your farm and change how you work here? Well, it's going to change our farm in a big way. We've already got an existing railway going one way through the farm, and this one is just going to quarterise the farm. It's going through the last remaining gap of green belt between Coventry and Kenilworth. And um, it's an unknown quantity for us, really. We won't know how we'll be able to farm it, whether we'll be allowed to stay, because the proposed track where it is is fairly close to the house. Um, We've been told nothing, really, about what's going to happen for us. Um, We're just waiting, really. Jerry Marshall, you're the chairman of the Action Groups Against High Speed 2. The Transport Select Committee believes that High Speed 2 could be the catalyst to rebalance the UK economy, reduce the north-south divide, create a dramatic shift in connectivity, not only between cities, but, you know, at first, Birmingham and to the continent without change. Your reaction to this report? Well, that's not actually what the report says. The report says it's very difficult to predict the economic benefits of high-speed rail. Uh, It's very uncertain. It says it could be the catalyst. Yes, uh, it it could be. High-speed rail could help. Most economists, of course, say that the the benefits, uh, that there won't be benefits. um, And the report contains a lot of damning criticism of uh, the Department for Transport, and they've asked for information which will completely destroy the case for it. For example, they're saying that they need a lower value on time, which accounts for something like 40% of the benefits. So the time saving should have a much lower value. They've also asked major questions about the 18 trains an hour, which will destroy the case for the capacity that high-speed rail produce. The French only manage 13 trains an hour, and they're saying we should have a fresh look at the viable alternatives to HS2. But it clearly endorses the High Speed 2 project. With some changes, will you ever support a 250 mile per hour line through here? Could you compromise on local interest for a big development like High Speed? This is absolutely not about local interest and there are organisations across the country from the Taxpayers Alliance to the Green Party against it. Uh, We are not against High Speed Rail. 250 miles an hour is probably inappropriate for the UK when we have such a uh, packed 
uh, tightly packed uh, population and much smaller distances than France, Germany and Spain. So speeding up existing lines and creating extra capacity is going to be much more affordable and much more effective to bring jobs and growth to our economy, not throwing it away on a high-speed line that isn't suitable. We await and hear more at the consultation in February. Jerry Marshall and Paul Hunt at Melbourne Grange Farm. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Nicholas Stanbridge, thank you. Well, listening to that is the chair of the Transport Select Committee, the Labour MP, uh, Louise Elman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it was clear, really, from Nicholas' discussion there that as a result of this report, you have expressed so many caveats in it that it is hard to work out where you stand. If there were no changes to what has been proposed, should it go ahead? We're convinced that there is a good case for a high-speed network and it's the only way that the inc necessary increased capacity for passengers and for freight can be delivered. But we do say that the investment in high-speed rail should not be as an alternative to investing in the existing rail because a freed existing classic line could develop more services locally and regionally. So we see this as a comprehensive project, a new dedicated high-speed line to achieve the increased capacity and connectivity required, but also investment in the existing line so that more local services can be delivered there. OK, so just purely on price, let's strip out everything. Purely in financial terms, it makes sense. Financially, it does make sense. It's a cost spread over 17 years of around £2 billion a year, and that's very close to what's being spent on Crossrail now. This is a major project. If it goes ahead, it will take place over many years, 17 years. Maybe that timetable will slip. So it has to be looked at very closely, and it has to be looked at as part of a comprehensive transport strategy. And indeed, we do criticise the government for not coming forward with that. But this is a serious report. It's looking at the project in great detail. We're looking at the big picture, the national interest, but we're looking at local factors as well. And there's a long way to go through the parliamentary process and looking at detail of this if the government decides it wants to go ahead. OK, but there is a price to be paid, as you acknowledge, that there may, have, there may be a substantial negative impact on the countryside, communities and people along the route. A major investment of this type will inevitably bring problems as well and we, we fully acknowledge those and indeed we do say it is wrong to castigate people who are expressing very legitimate concerns about what they feel would be the local impact and to call them nimbus. That, that is wrong. They have concerns. Ultimately, a decision has to be taken in the national interest. But there and are that, so ultimately, their decision. Yes, they have concerns. Effects. But sorry, forgive me. But ultimately, uh, the decision is that this should go ahead. In the end, Parliament will decide what happens. But there is a long way to go. If the government decides to go ahead, there will be very detailed consideration where local people can come and make their very local representations. The government has already said it will produce more information before Parliament considers what it wants to do. And indeed, we say that additional information in terms of the business case and the environmental issues must be produced. Uh, we think the network is needed, but we agree more information must be provided. And there is a very detailed and long parliamentary process in Involved mm. before any final decision is reached. And one of the things you've called for is for the government to look at this idea of actually not starting in London, but starting instead with in the north and building the links between Manchester and Leeds and Birmingham first. And yet, when you look at where the capacity is required, it's Birmingham to London which is struggling. Yes, and our report says that. We say that the building should start... Uh, Birmingham to London because that's where the greatest needs are but we also say that the project must not end at Birmingham and that's why we want a clear commitment from government at the very beginning of it seeking any parliamentary approval that this will continue beyond Birmingham. That's so you want the absolute important. commitment that it is going to be there even if you accept that it's 20 years before it happens? Yes, we do. Um, we don't see this as a London to Birmingham line. We see it as a high-speed network going at least to Leeds and to Manchester and perhaps beyond. And we want Louise. the firm commitment to Leeds and Manchester before any final decision is taken. Louise Elman, thank you very much.